I think the sort of thread of looking at impact and looking at innovation has something that I have really been doing since I left Iran and came here as an exchange student. Everybody who reads news, whether they believe in climate change or not, they're affected by it in any case. So as you're creating a portfolio, look at the risk as well, not just excited about the return. When Afsana Beshlas was growing up in Iran, her parents established core values of education and ambition early on. He was uh, chancellor of the oldest, largest university in Iran, responsible for all uh, the teacher training in Iran. And he was also an education innovator. Um, so he was a big influence, as was my mother. She taught me how not to cook so that I could do other things. Those priorities drove her to Oxford, where she studied economics. One of my professors at Oxford started the Oxford Energy Institute. He was a big influence in the sense that he said, maybe you should look at what's more innovative. Why don't you think about natural gas? It's also cleaner. That advice proved prescient. The 1979 revolution kept Beschloss from returning to Iran after Oxford. Instead, she immigrated to the United States and eventually joined the leadership ranks of the World Bank. When I came to the World Bank, um, I decided to go to the energy department and we did billions and billions of investments in natural gas, moving away from coal. Beschloss continues to focus on clean energy at Rock Creek, the $17 billion sustainable investing firm she founded in 2003. And she's not alone. In 2022, private equity investment in renewables hit a record-breaking $20 billion in the U.S. Climate is one thing that connects everybody across the globe. And if we don't do something about it, it brings down the value of all companies. So how could you be investing in a company without looking at that risk? The United States, as we talk today, is not in a recession. Some people fear a recession. Interest rates have been going up steadily for the last year or so. As we talk today, the Fed has just decided not to increase for the most recent uh, FOMC meeting, but it said it might increase in the future. Are you worried that we're going to go into a recession in the next year or so in the United States? I think it's going to be probably a softer landing um, in that camp. And um, the Fed, in its uh, statement, while it did not increase rates, was relatively hawkish because they added the potential of uh, having one more 50 basis point increase later this year. But the markets have not quite bought into that. So as you look at high inflation that we've had and now high interest rates, do you change your investment approach? And how have you changed your investment approach with respect to these factors? Um, so David, um, obviously we're, going, we're coming off a period of uh, very low interest rates, almost zero cost of capital, of course, for the last um, almost uh, seven, eight years. But before that also, we were in a low interest rate regime. Things are changing. 5% um, for treasury bills, three months and six months and one year treasury bills is quite a high rate. But you have to see that there is a regime change in interest rates, which means that the things that worked in the last 10 years are not going to work in the next 10 years. So your investors, your clients are institutional investors yes. and maybe some high net worth, family office and so forth. What kind of rate of return are you trying to get for your investors? I think um, we have... Um, different things that we're doing. We have two businesses. One is our private funds that are investing in energy transformation. And those will be like a growth equity type of investment in um, clean energy or in uh, reducing water use, uh, things like that. And those would be like any other growth equity, you know, private investment, sort of 20% plus. And so investors who invest in that, that's what the expectation is. Um, for our investors who are investing in what we call multi-asset class or outsourced chief investment officer services, those are more like, let's take a foundation. Um, it will be um, basically a 70-30 market, um, you know, 70 percent equity, 30 percent bonds, and then making sure that uh, that uh, that goal is met plus the fact that we have inflation, they can still spend 5% of their endowment. So that generally ends up being something closer to 8%. 8 Let's talk about your background. As I said, I think you've started the largest woman-owned investment firm in the United States, but it's clearly the largest 
woman-owned immigrant uh, <laughs> firm started by uh, a woman. So uh, let's talk about your background. Where, uh, where, where were you born? I was born in Iran, in, uh, I should say, pre-revolutionary Iran. Okay. There, it was under a different uh, The Shah uh, of Iran was uh, in control then? That's right. Okay, so when, when did you get out of Iran? Did you have to leave because of the Ayatollah coming in? I was very fortunate. I went to the international school in Tehran, and then when I was 15 or 16, I decided to uh, come to the United States as an exchange student. There was a program called the American Field Service. I applied, I got in, I came here, uh, and went to Concord, Massachusetts. So your father was a prominent academic, is that right? Yes. And what position did he rise up to? Um, he was uh, chancellor of the oldest, largest university in Iran, responsible for all uh, the teacher training in Iran. And he was also an education innovator. Um, so he was a big influence, as was my mother. She taught me how not to cook so that I could do other things. And you got your doctorate in what area? So I did not finish the doctorate because the revolution happened. So that is unfinished business. I finished my master's and, um, and as it happened, um, one of my professors at Oxford started the Oxford Energy Institute while I was at Oxford. He was a big influence in the sense that he said, well, if you go back to Iran or if you work on energy in, the, in, in uh, Europe or in the uh, United States, you're a woman. And this is sort of a man's world. Maybe you should look at what's more innovative. Why don't you think about natural gas? It's also cleaner. And that kind of stuck in the back of my head and, um, and was a big influence, I should say, throughout my whole career. All right, so in Oxford, you get your degree at Oxford, and then you, do you join the World Bank then? Uh, from Oxford, I um, uh, got an offer to go to um, Morgan Guarantee, which is now JP Morgan. And how long did you stay at uh, Morgan uh, Guarantee? I was there about three, four years, and then applied to the World Bank, because I realized I, my passion was economic development and doing something that had some social impact and while, you know, being in finance or economics and that the World Bank would be a good place. So I applied to the Young Professional Program and, uh, and was lucky to get in and went to the World right, Bank. So you moved to Washington to work yes. in the World Bank. Yes. And then you rose up to become the Treasurer and Chief Investment Officer of the World Bank. Yes. Is that right? Yes. So how much money does World Bank have to manage them? I mean, is that, that's a lot of money, right? Well, the balance sheet when I was treasurer was um, like 200, uh, in excess of 200 billion. The assets were close to 110, and we had also huge amounts of derivatives that we managed. When I came to the World Bank, um, I decided to go to the energy department, and um, my boss um, happened to be a woman by coincidence, the fastest risen woman at the bank at the time. And um, I told her my um, work at Oxford had included looking at natural gas. And I said, there's so much uh, coal getting used in India, in China, in uh, a lot of these uh, emerging economies, and we should do something about it. And she said, well, what can you do about it? I said, well, why don't you move them to investing more in natural gas? And she said, go do it. And we did billions and billions of investments in natural gas, moving away from coal, combined cycle power, transmission, all over emerging uh, economies. And then what year did you leave the World Bank? I left the World Bank in 2000, around 2001, and uh, close to 2000, yeah, 2001 um, to okay, go to Okay, so Carlisle. I should disclose that I recruited you to Carlisle yes. and wanted you to build out a fund of funds business. Yes. And you began to build it out, and ultimately yes. you took uh, control of it and ultimately uh, built it as an independent company, which today you, you lead. Um, today, how, how much money does the firm manage? Uh, close to 17 billion. Now, do you invest in young entrepreneurs or people like that? Have you found any superstars uh, early on that you can talk about? One of the things that we have always uh, invested in is uh, innovation in general. We've invested with one of the largest accelerators in the country, and, um, and we were very fortunate to through that, get uh, invested with, uh, with, uh, in OpenAI, for example, in 2015, um, on, in the early days. And meeting people that you know well, like Sam Altman or others who were early in, uh, in that journey uh, was really, really interesting. So let me ask you, um, is it harder to build a firm then or today if you're a woman or if you're an immigrant or, 
or a woman, woman and an immigrant? Which was the more complicated factor, if any? You know, it's interesting, David. I think being a woman is still very hard. You still see uh, mostly men? It's mostly men. And that has been something consistent in my career, whether it was energy, whether it was finance today. And doing a lot of work in um, clean energy and renewable energy right now, a lot of the companies are also um, ran by men. And it's not, so, so the evolution has been slower than you would expect. You see m many more immigrants, both men and women, at the helm of many companies. In your firm, how many uh, employees do you have? Close to about 100. And of those, how many are female? Close to half, and uh, the women are across the firm. They are in very senior positions in uh, heading investment area, as well as other areas in the firm. Climate is one thing that connects everybody across the globe. And if we don't do something about it, it brings down the value of all companies. The world is trying to fight the effects of climate change. To do this, the entire global structure for producing and using energy needs to transform from a system based on fossil fuels like oil and gas to one powered by clean energy sources like solar and wind. This major overhaul is called the energy transition, and it's currently underway. In 2022, global investment in the energy transition surpassed $1 trillion. But money doesn't solve every problem. In some areas, like California, older fossil fuel power plants are shutting down faster than renewable energy can replace them. As a result, the state often faces blackouts during summer heat waves. And some industries, like airlines, can't run on electricity, at least not yet. So while the energy transition faces many obstacles, one day this new system could be even more reliable than the old one. The phrase energy transition is commonly used today. Uh, what do we mean by energy transition and how realistic is it that there's going to be an energy transition over the next five years, 10 years, 15 years where carbon is going to be much less than it is today? It's happening as we're speaking. So um, the cost of solar and wind has gone down hugely. So the problems in terms of moving is not the economics because the economics of solar and wind has changed a lot compared to 20 years ago when I started or 25 years ago when I started working on this stuff. Um, what also has changed is new innovations coming into the market, all the research that's going into hydrogen or other fission or other kinds of fuels. That's the future beyond that. However, it is a transition. We all are using oil and gas in our lives. The problems that you have are not the technological problems, are not the financial problems. It's really getting the grid and getting either utilities or the public sector or the government to come in and spend some of the money of the IRA a little faster to, to build out the grid. So energy transformation is happening right now. It's just the speed could be much, much faster. Now, as we talk in the fall of this year, yes. there'll be a so-called COP28 meeting yes. in Abu Dhabi. Yes. Um, do you really think that there's gonna be enough progress in the COP meetings so that we're gonna see the temperature of the earth go down by the, the goal that they have? I am not as positive about COP28 or frankly, the current structure of these COP meetings because there is generally gridlock in most of them. And the promises that are made, for example, several COPs ago, a promise was made that 100 billion would get spent to in emerging markets for this energy transformation. Not um, Very little of that has come. So a lot of promises get made, there are great speeches made, but very little follow-up actually happens. So right now, uh, I think it's fair to say there's a lot of interest in impact investing, yes. uh, making a difference, not only getting a good rate of return, but doing something socially good. You've been in a, uh, a big advocate of this for a long time. When did you realize that you could make investments that had good social purpose as well as good, good rate, rates of return? Was that always part of your background or your focus? I think growing up and then when I was uh, studying economics at Oxford, I think I had some influences in terms of some of the professors I worked with. And they were talking about the fact that you could be having more stakeholders. That's not the word they used, but the fact that you could have more stakeholders benefit from the growth 
of uh, company or growth in the economy was starting about when I was starting uh, my economic studies. The conventional wisdom has always been that an investor should try to maximize returns, and you yes. do that by not excluding any potential investment. Absolutely. And so you don't worry about social impact. Your view, and the view of many others now, is that you can do both. You can get a good rate of return, and maybe even a better rate of return if you worry about social impact. Is that fair? What the experience of insurance companies, for example, have shown us is really for all investors. A lot of the things that we're calling social impact, I would put that aside for a second, but let's say just sticking to climate or um, environment, there are real risks that are affecting us every day. In New York, we could not breathe last week. In Washington, we could not breathe just because of the wildfires in Canada. Uh, so the point is we're all interconnected. The climate is one thing that connects everybody across the globe. And if we don't do something about it, it brings down the value of all companies. So how could you be investing in a company without looking at that risk, just like you're looking at any other risk? So when you make an investment or your mm -hmm. organization makes an investment, you're always taking into account the impact of climate. Is that yes. right? And you presumably are going to get a good rate of return because the world is moving in that direction of recognizing that climate impact is an important part of society and the economy, right? Absolutely. I, at my age, I don't know that there's enough time left in my life that I'm going to see a lot of progress in decarbonizing the atmosphere. But why uh, do you think uh, it's taken so long for people around the world to actually recognize that carbon is changing the earth, uh, climate, and so many other things? And do you think anything in my lifetime is likely to happen so that the climate change problem will be reduced from where it is now? I think it's moving really fast. I think, as you said, we went for a long time where pe some people were talking about it. I remember these IPCC reports uh, that came out when I was at the World Bank, some of the early ones, and it was only experts who read those. Now those are on the cover of the New York Times when they come out. Today, our children, their children, are really changing their lifestyles. Their carbon footprint is much smaller. The way they eat, the way they take jobs, the way they move, the way they choose their transport modes, or which cities they live in and how much they consume, they're very much more aware of than our generation. And I think they're impacting us. I think the sort of thread of looking at impact and looking at innovation has something that I have really been doing since I left Iran and came here as an exchange student. So what do you find appealing about the investment world? And would you recommend to young women who want to make a mark in the world that they go into the investment world or should they do something else? I think investments is a great area for women. And you can do it in different ways. You can be looking at uh, you know, running your own firm. Venture is an area which is um, smaller firms can thrive. So you can start with 50 million, you can start with 100 million um, assets or even smaller. And so it's an area for women or people of color uh, to start. And I'm seeing, I should say, women friends who are in bigger banks or in very large um, firms or including private equity or real estate or you know, sort of traditional uh, finance, finding it more difficult when they get to see certain positions. So let's suppose somebody is a young woman in college or yes. um, graduated college recently or a young man and he or she says, I want to go in the investor world. Do they need an MBA, would you say, or um, some other degree? Or what's the best training to be an investor? I think the MBA is um, a little bit um, sort of an old degree, the way it's designed right now. I think it um, might be a big investment of financial resources for not a huge addition to your income in future. I think people should see you know, what area they're interested in, if they're interested in energy, you know, go learn about that. Maybe take some courses on that. You don't need to do a degree program anymore. You can take a few courses and things you like and, and move on quickly into that area versus spending two years and a huge amount of resources. Now, you spend a fair amount of time on nonprofit related activities yes. and you're very involved in them. If I can remember some of them, you're the chairman of the PBS Foundation. Yes. 
Uh, you are on the uh, board of the Rockefeller Foundation. You are on the world board of the World Re Resources Institute, the board of the Georgetown University. You were on the board of the Institute for Advanced Study. Correct. And you are on the board of the Council on Farm Relations. So how do you have time for all those things? You know, it's really interesting because one of the things that I found uh, is really important to me is this, uh, what you talked about earlier, is making impact in your life. And when I was working at the World Bank, even if I was working on energy or finance, I felt I'm um, not just doing a job. We were generating growth, generating returns, but there was another impact. And I found when I moved to the private sector, I missed that other aspect. And I find working with uh, nonprofits, um, you know, I can give back in s some way. Um, that's element that I'm very interested in. So in your job, you have to travel the world a fair bit, meeting with investors, looking at opportunities. So do you ever get tired of that part of the job, traveling the world? And um, do you think any time in the near future, you're likely to be able to go back to Iran? Or you think it's unlikely that Iran is government's going to change and welcome you back uh, with open arms anytime soon? We had the biggest demonstration of women anywhere in the world in Iran in the last year. Uh, sadly, it has not led to you know, much change. You know, uh, if anything, there is a lot of backtracking. The one thing that I'm not as positive as I used to be is really going back to Iran. So that is, you know, makes me sad. But also a lot of other countries are moving in that direction. And that is bad, not because you're basically taking 50% of the population, which is women, and really putting them in a secondary position, which is a huge waste. Um, Coming back to, to travel, I think I'm so used to traveling, you know. Um, I think travel has not been something I mind, and I, can, I think I will continue doing that. And that's the only way to learn, really, to go sit with smart people and learn from them. Let's suppose you're on a plane and somebody realizes who you are. They say, I have $100,000. I don't know what to do with it. Uh, where should I invest it? Where should they put their money? So today, it's a easier decision than it was maybe two years ago, um, because treasury bills are 5%. So I would say, you know, uh, regardless of how much risk you want to take, you have to put a portion there. Then you would have to ask really, an individual is the same, I think, as any institution. What is your time frame? Do you need to get access to this $100,000 in the next few weeks, the next few months, the next few years, not until you retire? And that will determine your investment decision. So what do you think is the most common mistake investors make uh, when, they, when they have 100,000, a million, or whatever they might have? What is the most common mistake you have observed that investors make? I would say hubris and thinking you know more than you do because every decision that you make has many, many layers. So as you're creating a portfolio, look at the risk as well, not just excited about the return. And what's the best investment advice anybody's ever given to you? Continue to learn about innovation in whatever you do, because that is where it's not exciting, is that's where returns will go. Well, it's a very interesting career you've had, and I know you're not at the end of it. You might wind up as Secretary of Treasury, head of the World Bank, something like that someday. So um, if you could look back in your life, um, considering all the things you've done, what are you most proud of having achieved? My two boys. No question that that comes first. Um, and, um, and then I'm really excited about, you know, what I've done. And it may not have seemed at the time that there was a continuous line through it. It seemed kind of disjointed at the time. But going back, I think the sort of thread of looking at impact and looking at innovation has something that I have really been doing since I left Iran and came here as an exchange student.